convention, the ninth annual one. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, reading the panel description to give everybody an idea of what sort of questions we're going to be answering today. Awesome. Okay, so this was the description that was given out along with the questions. The bourgeois revolution strove to subordinate the power of the state to the interests of civil society. Yet the revolutions of 1848 disappointed, resulting in the recrudescence of the state, which rose above society to maintain order. Revolutionaries were divided over how to respond. Could the state serve as a means of emancipation? Or was it a force of counter-revolution that had to be smashed? For Marx, the capitalist or Bonapartist state had to be smashed, but this could only be accomplished by constituting a new state power, a dictatorship of the proletariat that could realize the emancipatory potential unleashed by capitalism. Instead of either accepting or rejecting it, the proletariat had to render the function of the Bonaparte state self-critical. In his 1875 critique of the Goethe program, Marx warned his followers against regressing to the Lasallian affirmation of the state. Such capitulation was an ever-present risk, tempting the workers to support the political reconstitution of capitalism through state power rather than overcoming both capitalism and the state through social revolution. After World War I, organized labor was increasingly integrated into the state. Uh, in supporting the New Deal, communists deferred to capitalist state welfare, downplaying the goal of the revolution. In 1935, the National Labor Relations Act, in aiming to protect the rights of workers and sub subordinated organized labor to the state, which had to balance these rights against the interests of the public in the free flow of commerce. As the AFL and CIO became core constituencies of the Democratic Party, the class struggle was repudiated in favor of partnership of labor and capital brokered by the state. While the New Left initially reacted against the parochial arrangement, the 70s witnessed a turn toward militant labor organizing, particularly in the public sector. However, this grassroots upsurge coincided with the decline of the welfare state and the rise of neoliberalism, whose champions, Democrat as well as Republican, used state power to launch an assault on the labor movement. How does the state function today? How is it the product of a history of leftist struggles? Is there a way in which workers in the era of Trump are able to make sense of and redeem labor's history with the state to develop, as Marxists contend, a dialectical rather than affirmative or negative relation to the state? So I will start by uh, introducing our panelists. <coughs> so on the far side is Bill Pelz. Um, William A. Pelz is Director of the Institute of Working Class History in Chicago and Professor of History at Elgin Community College. His recent works include Wilhelm Liebknecht and German Social Democracy in his market books, Karl Marx, The World to Win, Pearson, and Against Capitalism, The European Left on the March. Um, Jamil, might need help with the French pronunciation, I apologize. Um, coming from Paris, France, uh, he worked as a social worker, educator, and teacher. Um, he is a grassroots activist and participated in the theoretical group Du Commons, something, yeah. And uh, with the Greek review of Protagma, yes, which is project. Okay. And he's a participant in student social movements in France. And then finally, Rich Schultz is a member of the radical sex worker collective Support Pose and involved with organizing Sludwalk Chicago. Um, they are also, she is also a 2017, they, they are a 2017 master's candidate in art history, theory and criticism at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Their academic and organizing work centers uh, tra around transgressive bodies, queerness and resistance. And so the setup today is we're going to have 10 to 12 minutes of opening remarks, then three to five minutes of responses, and then the rest will be for Q&A. So, uh, Bill, would you like to start? No. No. We <laughs> did, Okay. Will I start? Will I start? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I see a perfect example of the way the state operates. Right? It operates through direction. Uh, you know, there's, there's something to be said for the old shorthand where Frederick Engels said in the final analysis of the state is nothing more than a body of armed men. In other words, we have to remember that a state ultimately you know, sort of reflects itself on compulsion, on, on force. And I think that the problem that often we have when we think of the state is it's very easy to fall into the illusion that the state is somehow a neutral vessel that then can be filled with whatever wishes and wills 
the population through struggle, admittedly, uh, perhaps through electoral struggle, mass movements, and so on, can fill. Or, making the opposite mistake, to assume the state is so all-powerful that elections and mass movements have no impact on it. The truth is actually sort of dialectically in between those two things. On the one hand, the state will resist and fight against any effort to change it, yet if it was that brittle, it would break. I think that's one of the reasons why you saw the collapse of czarism in Russia in 1917, is it was so brittle, it broke. Most states, however, are much more flexible. They're willing to make deals. They're willing to retreat. They're willing to give up something if they can keep certain core constituencies. Uh, one of my fields of studies is uh, Weimar Germany and the German Revolution. I mean, I sort of think of the Imperial German Army uh, who just completely hated the common people, uh, thought they were scum and everything else, yet when they no longer could command their troops, when people were just marching with their feet and going home, and they were worried because they were talking about their soldiers, Soviets, or, you know, workers' councils and so on being set up, that maybe the whole Imperial German high command would be dismantled and you have a Republican, small r, uh, military created in the new Germany, then they immediately rush and try to make a deal with the more moderate social democrats who are forming the provisional government. And they promise, they swear up and down, that they support this new government against any sort of radicals and so on and so forth. Now, of course, they're not sincere. Uh, when there's an attempted coup d'etat, um, the cop push, uh, 1920, they don't do anything to really stop it. It's the workers who stop it. And of course, they, all their promises mean nothing when Hitler comes along and cuts them what they think is a better deal, right? But the point is you couldn't say that, well, the only way we're going to defeat the army is to have all the generals hung, because otherwise they're just fighting the end. No, no, they're willing to go home if they know they've lost for the moment, but then they'll come back. So Hindenburg, uh, supreme commander of the German force in World War I, he goes home as, you know, a general, field marshal, I should say, and he later comes back as president of the Weimar Republic. Right? You have to be flexible with these things. So I think the state, uh, no, no, seriously, you have to be flexible about these things. I think the state is far more complex than people think, and I think we really run the risk of falling into those one or two mistaken ideas. Either the state is so strong that and so brittle that it's going to take a violent upheaval to destroy it, to get the slightest things. Or the other mistake, which is so prevalent, I would say, in the United States, uh, among followers of the Democratic Party and so on, is that, well, if we just elected good people to political office, uh, the state would change, which is another confusion. Uh, you know, you can elect 100 senators who are all progressive, and that means you have 100 people in office. That doesn't necessarily mean you have 100 people in power, right? Because as we saw with so many cases, uh, Allende in Chile in the 70s, uh, you can be in office, but not necessarily totally be in power. Because the state has many different aspects to it. And I think that what I kind of put forward here today is a plea to sort of avoid simplistic notions of what the state is and analyze the state in every particular na nation state context, in every particular historical context, and see exactly what its modus operandi is. Exactly how does it function? Right? Is it more prone to repression? That's true in some places. Or is it more, more prone to co-optation? Right? Does it throw you in jail? Or does, or does it offer you a chance to run for Senate? Right? What, I mean, what is the, the focus of it? And of course, they're going to be using both carrots and sticks in every instance, but you know, what's, the, what's the history of it, and what's the dynamic? What are the transmission belts that the state uses, such as various political parties, social organizations, uh, NGOs of various sorts, to help back it up? So not to think of the state in a, in a narrow sense, not to think of it in a dogmatic sense, but really try to look at the different ways the state works. And so you can win concessions from the state, but that's not the same as changing the state. That's not the same as changing. Maybe 100 progressive senators would be an improvement of some sort, certainly seems so today. However, that wouldn't change the fact that the Senate is structurally an undemocratic body, right? Where 
Wyoming, which has more wild horses than it has citizens, right, gets two senators. And California, which is the size of a medium-sized European country, only gets two senators, right? There's no one person, one vote when you're talking about the U.S. Senate. And we could go on and on. Like the president, uh, like the French are having a presidential election, and whatever you think of the French or the French political system, as many critiques my, my comrade here could probably make of it, the fact is they have a curious notion. And the curious notion they have is that the president of France has to be the person who gets the most votes. They have to get over 50% of the votes. Now, how weird is that? Right? We have a much more sophisticated system where the person who gets the most votes doesn't necessarily win because we have this wonderful electoral college based on the difference of the 50 states and so on uh, that gets to choose the president. So in 2000, the person who got the most votes didn't get to be president. Right? In our last election, the person who got the most votes didn't get to be president. So you know, each state has, has different mechanisms they use. So at that, I'm going to leave it because I don't want to waste too much time with these general remarks, get to other comments. And I also want to sort of urge that we have a really robust, you know, muscular dialogue when we have the question and answer. Because I think that's where we really learn the most is, you know, the give and take, the thrust of the debate and so on. So that's where I'll leave it. Uh, see here again. Yeah, I'm yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. This is a very impressive gathering. It's pretty wonderful to get this many people in a room to talk about uh, smashing the state. Um, we cannot hold a discussion on labor in the state without speaking directly about those workers whom the state disenfranchises. Uh, we should definitely include the working struggles of incarcerated folks whose labor is often uncompensated, assigned pennies on the dollar, and stolen by the state and private companies for profit here in this country. We should discuss those whose labor is socially reproductive, emotional, domestic, and sexual, whose labor is not recognized as labor at all. And we should certainly include those folks in labor, in alternative, who labor in alternative economies, whose work is considered below board and criminalized. Part of this group that I will specifically address in this panel will be sex working people and erotic laborers. Those workers most affected within this group are full service outdoor and indoor escorts, sex workers of color, and queer and trans sex workers. It is important to acknowledge, however, that the hatred, fear, discrimination, and stigma against sex workers, what we would identify as whorephobia, extends into all sex working fields. This whorephobia is conveniently and violently propped up by the state through criminalization. So I'm going to be speaking specifically about sex work in the US. Uh, however, when addressing organizing, I will necessarily need to include international struggles against state-sanctioned violence. Um, so we'll go from kind of you know, more US-centered focus in the talk, and then we'll get a little broader as we talk about resistance. Okay? The history of work in this country directly corresponds to the erotic labor performed by sex workers of all varieties since the country's inception, meaning there would be no railroad, there would be no urban metropolises, there would be no port cities, there would be no rural outposts without economic stimulation by sex workers. Traveling sex workers during the American Revolution were a group of people that kept those military uh, forces moving. Uh, there were sex workers, and, and this is fun, y'all, we can laugh. Um, New the, the New Amsterdam colony, the Louisiana colony, and the San Francisco uh, circa gold rush of uh, 1849 through 51, all would not have happened or flourished without the direct economic stimulation, you can laugh again, <laughs> of and by sex workers. Legitimate and state-sanctioned red light districts are established as early as the 1890s. And for example, pre-criminalization in the early years of San Francisco, sex workers were offered protection by city officials, and the city established the first sex worker health clinic. From 1911 to 1913, the municipal clinic offered free syphilis treatment for sex workers and testing for only 50 cents. The clinic's supervising physician, uh, Dr. O.B. Spaulding, even secured city protections for property staff and patients by agreeing to legislation requiring sex workers to carry a clinic-issued bill of health 
or else face arrest for vacancy. Although the clinic operated for a little longer than two years, it reduced venereal disease among sex workers by more than 60%. These protections and securities were tenuous and short-lived, however, as you can imagine. Under pressure from city clergymen, Mayor James Rolfe ordered police protection withdrawn. Um, the police were new in that particular era of San Francisco as well. Uh, sex workers were no longer required to carry um, bills, but nor were they offered any physical or legal protection. As the clinic could no longer offer any kind of safe space, and punishments for having or not having a bill were now one and the same, prostitutes quickly stopped seeking treatment and testing, um, and the municipal clinic shuttered soon thereafter. Um, so I'm, I'm drawing this history, and it comes from a recent piece by Cyrus Wood um, called Sex Work in San Francisco, Navigating Morality, Health, and Laws Across the Ages. Now, that being said, it bears mentioning, and strong mentioning, that this economic growth and land grab expansion was possible only through the displacement of and genocidal violence toward indigenous peoples, right? The sexual violence against Native American women and two-spirit people used as a tactic of war in this country. So we cannot obscure this history of violence against the state and the emergent state as well, right? So we need to bear that in mind when we're talking about kind of the growth and economic stimulation of this country. So I'm going to move into a broad overview of the history of the criminalization of sex work and sex working people. Um, as Melissa Gere Grant puts in her piece, When Prostitution Wasn't a Crime, quote, it is important to remember that even prior to the establishment of American red light districts, the act of selling sex or sexual entertainment was not universally illegal in the United States. And the law didn't recognize a behavior called, quote, prostitution or a person called a prostitute. This isn't to say that people who sold sex weren't targeted by the cops. Uh, they were, and they were charged with a host of crimes put on the books largely um, in order to target them. And the women who came to be known as prostitutes were still viewed uh, before that as social outcasts for living without men, having sex outside of marriage, making their own money. Um, there were also many women and some men who made a living trading sex and did so discreetly. Uh, but who did not attract police attention since they, through advantage, could pass more easily in polite society. So when laws did, did target actual sexual conduct, they didn't just go after people in the sex trade. Okay? In the state of Louisiana, people in the sex trade, along with men caught having sex with men, could be charged with violating an 1805 law that declared engaging in oral or anal intercourse um, for order compensation or for free to be a crime against nature. Uh, this law was actually recently ruled unconstitutional in 2012. I think I'll Yeah, yeah, 2012, y'all. <laughs> Essentially, what this history tells us is that the social reformers in the early 1900s began pressuring the state, forming organizations, getting elected to local positions of authority. This shifted the state's priorities of regulation, profit, and exploitation to the criminalization of sex work, primarily prostitution. Here we see the early origins of white saviorism, what we call the rescue industry, and these tendencies included the white slave panic concerns, they included folks like prohibitionists and suffragettes. This turn toward a, quote, social reform was coupled with a new carceral approach to, quote, protect society, which saw the rise of the first modern women's prisons in the U.S., racist eugenics projects, a hyperfixation with hygienic rhetoric, and the characterization of the state as safeguarding the morality of the nation. Language such as purity, sanctity, cleansing, protecting, dominated new policy discourse. The so-called progressive era saw agents of the state work with bourgeois philanthropists and hobby moralists to bring in reform legislation that on the one hand would seemingly protect gendered workforces and, and also children, laborers, right? but while at the same time censoring and criminalizing others. Now don't get me wrong, there, there was a lot of pressure and organizing from union movements led by anarchists and socialists alike that led to promising improvements in working and living conditions in rapidly growing urban areas. However, this came in the tidal wave of reform policies, legislation, and popular workplace victories that either wholly ignored those workers in the sex trade, or outright demonized them and blamed them for the inner city conditions themselves. So, what does state intervention look like for criminalized workers and sex workers in particular? And it could bring us into the, the modern um, era, right? Um, although a lot of these things um, come out of that specific moment that I was just referencing. 
Um, so state intervention looks like incarceration. Uh, arresting sex workers and their clients is a multi-billion dollar operation for police and federal agencies across this country. Uh, deportation. Migrant and undocumented sex workers, of course, face deportation if outed either in emergency rooms, if they seek crisis services, or if they are caught actually working. This looks like arrest, stings, and raids. Uh, we could talk, I mean, for hours about our local sheriff, Tom Dart, here in Chicago, uh, and the millions of dollars um, that his county is actually sinking into the sting operations and raids of adult consenting sex workers um, in order to, quote, save women and girls. Um, so we could carry on about him forever. Um, state intervention looks like a loss of access to affordable housing if you have prostitution record, uh, loss of access to Medicare, Medicaid, loss of parental rights to children, loss of desired income or work flexibility, a humiliating mandatory exit program that you are subjected to if uh, you decide to defer jail time your first for your first prostitution charge. Um, this looks like John schools for clients, other humiliating exit programs to try to quote re-educate clients buying sex. This looks like police abuse and terror in communities, including rape and sexual harassment and assault um, by police on the bodies of sex workers. This looks like the channeling of funds, resources, um, to bogus, quote, rescue industry non-for-profits, so whole um, religious or other non-for-profit organizations that spring up to, quote, save women, to help them um, exit this um, disgusting field of work, right? Uh, and they get tons of money from the state um, and other local um, authorities to carry out um, bad data um, and bad presentations, you get like a little granola bar and a cup of water in eight hours of being told that you don't have agency over your own body, and then you're shipped out. Um, this looks like shuttering of safe and trusted vetting sites, um, for instance, Backpage.com. This also looks like uh, censoring and um, attack of strolls in our local um, like areas where, where sex workers work outdoors. Um, so the list goes on and on, um, but this is a way to characterize exactly what state intervention looks like for sex working people or those in the sex trade today. Now, alongside that, there exists a history of sex workers fighting back and organizing. This looks like community self-protection, so paying off cops, paying off city officials, running their own security, um, having lawyers on retainer, using vetting services online, screening, workplace organizing, and strip clubs, cooperative brothel structures, this can also look like advocacy days of action, so what we would more um, associate with protests. So, for instance, March 3rd is International Sex Workers' Rights Day. Um, that was founded by a group of sex workers in India, which boasts um, over 50,000 members in their union. That's the Durbar Mahila um, Samanwaya Committee. Uh, December 17th is a day that was um, enacted um, called International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers. That was founded here in the U.S. Um, specifically commemorating and honoring those sex workers um, who were murdered by the Green River Killer in Seattle, Washington, uh, who murdered uh, at least 71 sex workers between 1982 and 1998. Um, this also looks like unionizing efforts, right? So dancers at the Lusty Lady in San Francisco established SEC <coughs> Local 790 from 1997 to 2013. This also looks like the IWW having the Sex Trade Workers Industrial Union Local 690. Um, it also means that sex workers use the strike to demand respect, workers' rights, um, and they take the lead from international sex worker movements. Um, so June 2nd is International Horrors Day, and it's been celebrated annually since 1976, which commemorates the occupation of the St. Nizier Church in Lyon, France, by more than 100 sex workers on that same day in 1975 to draw attention to inhumane working conditions and police brutality. They, they held that occupation for eight days, by the way. Um, since the late 1980s, sex workers across South and Central America, along with their non-sex working sisters, um, have withheld erotic labor or participated in sex strikes as direct action against working conditions, gender-based violence, and transphobia. And, I mean, the list can go on and on. Um, since I do need to start wrapping up my remarks, I will say um, that just this past month, on March 8th, I actually took part in the Global Women's and Gender Strike, along with tens of thousands of other sex workers around the world, demanding to be included in strike activities um, for International Working Women's Day. From Argentina to India, from Ireland to Mexico to the US, 
sex workers all around the world took part in strike actions indicting the state and society. So why do we need decriminalization of all adult consenting and chosen erotic labor to actually advance a workers' movement? Um, I think all of us in this room can agree that workers should not be criminalized for the work that they do. Um, I mean, except for cops and prison guards for whom I offer no protection or, you know, have any place in my labor philosophy. Um, all workers deserve the right to organize freely without harassment or fear of violent reprisal. And as long as we live under a system that requires us to labor for a wage, workers deserve the opportunity to pursue safe and equitable work environments. And as radical, socialist, anarchist, Marxists, we must proceed from this position. And that philosophical and practical organizing um, necessarily requires harm reduction tactics. So what does decriminalization look like? Decriminalization requires an immediate moratorium on arrests and raids of sex workers and clients, as you might imagine. It involves um, revocation of punitive laws surrounding sex work, the immediate channeling of all county, state police funds for prostitution arrests into actual harm reduction programs, and the immediate release of all sex workers who are incarcerated for prostitution charges or charges relating to their self-defense while performing erotic labor, and policy-based um, decoupling of sex work from human trafficking and sex trafficking, and inclusion of sex work as a potential protected category to combat uh, discrimination excuse me, and workers being barred from public services, so healthcare, recourse to challenge police brutality, et cetera. So decriminalization would mean a cultural shift as well as a policy shift. Demanding decriminalization and anti-carceral harm reduction tactics, broadly speaking, directly challenges the whorephobia of the state and society. Um, and that is exactly the approach in organizing labor we should be engaged in. Well, hello everybody. Uh, so I'm coming from France and I'm just a uh, last minute feeling because there were some issues about weather uh, in Atlanta. So I tried to do my best and uh, I'm humbled uh, to be here and thankful to be invited and thank you for the two brilliant uh, expose uh, presentations that will make me look very bad I think. <laughs> um, so I will just try to address few points uh, and then try to explain them through discussion, exchange. This is, it is the best way for both uh, you and me, I, I guess, now. Um, so, um, I come from, uh, I uh, come from the with uh, my friends in Paris and uh, in Greece, we try to develop uh, a critical and unorthodox un 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 approach coming from a political tradition that considers left and right distinction more or less obsolete and a bit uh, and more and more irrelevant since uh, the 60s and uh, the, the the rise of the of what what we can call the the consumer society, right? And I will explain later how I related to the state of it. Uh, but I will start with uh, some uh, theoretical background, if uh, you follow me. Um, and it's mainly, the, this critique uh, is brilliantly developed by thinkers like uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, Cornelius Castoriadis or and, uh, Christopher Lash, and uh, this critique is mainly articulated around this following basic idea. Left-right distinction seems uh, obsolete not only because the original radical left lost many of its properly left-wing threats, moving more and more to the right, but, but the real problem lies in the fact that many fundamental, fundamental left-wing beliefs, uh, the, the real problem lies, in fact, uh, that uh, many uh, fundamental left uh, beliefs uh, are a bit um, blurry, uh, saying, <coughs> uh, 
yeah, yeah, it was in reality, uh, they were in reality um, right from the start, shared by both right and left. Uh, and these are the followings, like uh, belief in progress, apolitical uh, technophilia, uh, primacy of uh, material uh, economic factors, which can be uh, also understood as uh, economism uh, reductionism, economist reductionism, uh, scientism, and uh, the very uh, important distinction between revolutionary experts and uneducated, uneducated masses, uh, meaning uh, based on the separation, division between rulers and rule, and governors and govern. And uh, these are not new critics. Uh, these are linked to the traditions of uh, Karl Korsch and Frankfurt, Frankfurt School uh, thinkers of first generation, uh, Conservism communism, and uh, they were deepened by the, these, uh, the, by the critics uh, I mentioned before, Castoriadis, Arendt, and Lash, and they will, uh, they will point out that the left actually actively participated in the gra gradual crystallization of the contemporary paradigm uh, consumer society, uh, which is based on, uh, uh, if we can sum up, uh, cultural liberalism understood as uh, the celebration of the all important individual. And it's um, actually linked to a very negative uh, conception of freedom. Uh, seeing rules and limits as an oppression and uh, unbearable obstruction to their individual liberty, which escaped the fundamental question of power and the necessity of building institutions and uh, create context that allows freedom to, to strengthen uh, through practice and uh, in order to bloom. Uh, so, um, taking a uh, uh, re... Uh, in the following of your thoughts that the uh, state is not neutral or is not something we can uh, just uh, ignore, I would say that uh, state uh, understood as a, a central uh, social institution is very important, but it's based on the, on the social separation and mediacy and uh, between the uh, rulers and uh, ruled governors uh, and governed. And so the one of the main problems is not about uh, state himself himself. Or, but uh, it's the question of power and how we can organize to, to smash it. And to smash it may be an illusion, uh, meaning we have to, this is something external to us. And it would be more following these thinkers, uh, which I found uh, very uh, important uh, on this point. It's more about uh, what kind of relation you try to establish with your social institutions. And uh, because the social institutions are basically ruling social life uh, to regulate and organize it, uh, if it's uh, exterior to, to you, uh, You have to establish a, a new relation uh, where you are the one in charge. Uh, and so you can't, uh, there are, I will try to, to, to illustrate my purpose, my purpose with uh, two errors, two big errors uh, in the attitude toward the state. One is uh, we have to conquer state, state by all necessary means, uh, meaning uh, it's uh, only through state that we can 
do something which is uh, not actually uh, totally false because state is the central uh, uh, central um, processor of power in our society, but uh, it uh, it's it's blinding uh, its itself. This conception is blinding itself in the the way that uh, it doesn't. Uh, it believes that uh, it's neutral, just like you said before, meaning it's just a neutral tool that we just have to conquer and to, to use in, in a good way, with good politicians, with uh, honest people. But it's, very, it's a very uh, mistaken uh, conception, uh, because state itself is uh, organized in a very hierarchy, hierarchical, <laughs> Why? Um, and if uh, you try one of the big historical error of uh, era of um, the second uh, international or vanguard uh, parties was that uh, politics became their uh, a career and uh, a profession, and it was based on the conception that they are on one side. Uh, experts, professional experts, uh, and on the other side, uneducated, uneducated masses. And uh, through this process, uh, it was uh, excluding uh, the masses uh, you, you appeal to in order to conquest, and it was uh, making a habit uh, to have a uh, a relation to these masses, a very hierarchical, a very hierarchical, and uh, so in the in the way to conquer, to conquer power, you just lose your freedom, your critical thinking, your creativity, and it was a disaster on uh, some part. We, we could see that uh, with the tremendous challenges. Uh, uh, for example, the Bolshevik Party had to face just after uh, the revolution, uh, being very suspicious of uh, everything that were not uh, scientifically uh, proven in uh, Marxism, uh, understood almost like a, a religion that you have to be, uh, that they pretend to be the best priest for. And, uh, and it's contradictory to aim to freedom in a way that is killing literally freedom. So, second point is, uh, I'll try maybe to, to, uh, to be clear and exchange it. Um, and the second point, uh, opposite to that, is uh, thinking that uh, we don't have to care about the state. Uh, we have to build a little society, uh, uh, experiencing uh, our directly our uh, our own uh, uh, views and ideals, uh, thinking that at some point it will the state will just ignore it, and it's a, a very pessimistic view uh, um, because we have to understand that uh, freedom understand, understood as uh, autonomy, meaning uh, you choose your own laws and you choose your, the, own, the, the, the very limits that you will be as an individual and, uh, and as a collectivity <coughs> submitted to. Because uh, it concerns us and it concerns everybody and it concerns the very uh, conception we will uh, have of freedom, we have to discuss it. And we have to discuss it on the uh, equalitarian and uh, possibility of participation. And uh, because we are all concerned about that. And because this is actually what is really freedom and equality. It's not just um, on uh, an economic. Uh, Standpoint, because we could see that uh, 
yeah. Um, on the nationalization uh, thinking uh, at some point, it says that hey, because it's nationalized, uh, because property are, and big industries are nationalized, everybody is equal. But some are more equal than others because they, they can decide how to organize, how to rule. And this is a tremendous power they have over other over, uh, other people, workers. They pretended to to show the great way uh, to, to freedom by excluding them uh, by exclu and not uh, accepting their insights or creativity or because uh, when you know the the field or the when you have uh, practical experience, you have some insight about uh, the problem you are really facing, and uh, and we have to uh, learn uh, through uh, discussion, through, through critical thinking, through uh, responsabilization, uh, through uh, through practically exercising exercising power. How to overcome it collectively? So, uh, so if you, so with the autonomy, you have to think on both uh, individual side and uh, collective side um, as very uh, intimately linked because the social context will. Uh, <coughs> Will shape the very conception you have of freedom and equality and justice. And uh, I will stop there and try to. Thanks very much. So now we'll have uh, two minute responses or three minute responses between the panelists. Would you like to go first? That shows what you can do with the stage. Push back against them. They then tend to develop a certain fear. <laughs> no, big marches, big masses, general strikes, and so on. You know, they start to know. It's important to keep in mind. You know, example. Uh, first, I wanted to go to the question of sex workers. I think that one of the things that is interesting is whether or not sex workers can actually achieve strong enough organizations basically like trade unions, where they can actually fight back, push back against the state successfully. Because this is very important, it seems to me, that like any group of workers, if they're going to be, you know, individual, automized people, they can write letters to the editor, or, you know, have an online petition or some such thing, nonsense. But I mean they really need some social clout and that's where you would need unions. I know there's like like unions in the Netherlands is recognized by the official union uh, federation, which is a which is a big deal. No offense to the IWW, but it means that they're considered part of the actual workers' movement. In their own. So I, I, that's something I'd like you to comment on at, at, at some point. And what I wanted to ask about your thinking is, you talked about Karl Porsche and so on. Were you influenced at all in your thinking by Sorrel? I mean, this is a general strike, right? and, vi and how violence uh, affects him. I mean, how do you feel about Sorrel and how? His series would, would fit in with your, your thinking. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with, with Sorrel. Uh, I'm not such a good uh, academic and theorist well, uh, as you are. Well, but, you, uh, you mentioned Carl Korsh. I mean, I figured you'd go all the way. Start name dropping. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> the mask is falling. Yeah. <laughs> Just like the states, like the Wizard of Oz, it's just the man behind the, the big screen, it's all filled and completely. Can you uh, explain to me uh, how you, what would be sort of the, and then I well, could, uh, the whole idea of, of the myth of the general strike that things can yeah. can change just because of how yeah. people feel and a certain ideology. Because yeah. you were sort of hinting yes, at that. Yes. Can I? Uh, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's. Um, I will uh, answer that uh, by highlighting the deadlock we are facing uh, since, I would say, uh, May 68. 
because the, the devil point it's a false alternative because you have uh, it's a myth uh, because spontaneous spontaneous uh, I think is quite um, influ influenced by the idea that we have to make protests to make uh, oppositions everywhere we can and then organize big protests and then the, the protest will be bigger and bigger and general strike and then we can uh, smash the state and free ourselves uh, in, uh, and this will be paradise. So this is very blinding and very uh, false conception, uh, uh, I hope. Uh, I, I hope and I guess and I think. Uh, because it, it's, I think it's a way to avoid the question of power. And how you instituate uh, new new institutions, and uh, which will allow uh, freedom to to exist and to uh, and to be experienced and practiced by the people, and so extending more and more. So at some point, and uh, this is linked to the negative uh, conception of freedom I was talking about. And uh, it's not answering, okay, because uh, in May 68 in France, the, they addressed uh, the power and the state uh, so so powerful and unexpected shape that at some point they, were, they didn't know how to respond. And everybody, everything, every institution were powerless. Uh, in front of a such uh, autonomous and uh, freedom explosion. But uh, uh, the students they, and the workers at the time, they didn't know how to make it live because it was, uh, it was uh, such an eruption. Uh, you can't live uh, this intensity on the long, uh, on the, all your life. It's impossible. You have to, to to build some some housing or some some pillars <coughs> to it to support it and to uh, to continue uh, giving you energy and to and uh, these really, these uh, institutions have to, to to be incarnations of the, the values you are pushing for. And the fact that they refuse, and uh, not refuse, but uh, they say they say no, uh, we don't want to touch power because it's evil, and that's uh, that, that left uh, a big uh, that was a big mistake, and maybe uh, because they were surprised themselves that. How can we do now? And so it was very clear. I don't know if I you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's that's the project, right? Is is worker organization, trade unionism, um, in order to push back against um, not just. Uh, you know, societal misconceptions or stigma, right, but also to directly challenge um, the disenfranchisement of a working group of people, right? So that's the project. Um, I will start by saying we have a difficult time uh, in this country with that project um, and other places around the world, specifically because of the criminalized nature of the work. So I think that we always have to come back to when we're having this conversation about what it would take to organize in workplaces <coughs> or to organize more broadly um, within the trade or industry, um, as long as you're a criminalized worker, there's a special oppression there, right? And so, in terms of organizing yourself and your fellow workers. Um, that being said, you know, I, I, I alluded to a um, 16 year long, really uh, amazing run of SEIU Local 790 at the Lusty Lady um, here um, in San Francisco, well, here, here in the US in San Francisco. 
um, as really indicative of the kind of um, organizing strength and power that that could take um, to, to actually affect change. Um, that being said, um, there, there are so many factors that go into this, right? Um, because you're not um, a miner, um, like, in, like in a mine. Um, because you're not, um, uh, more of one of those. Um, because you're not, um, you know, working in a field that is, you know, not criminalized or already accepted as labor. Um, you have you have those strikes against you, right? Um, and so you're facing that in particular. You're also facing um, like inter um, issues within sex worker communities, right? So that's like racism, that's classism within um, sex worker communities because there are different stratifications of sex work, right? But when we say sex work, this is an umbrella term that includes. Um, you know, stripping, which is which is often not criminalized, but targeted in different ways by the state or society. Um, this also includes phone sex operators. I'm one of those too. Um, not criminalized directly, but stigmatized uh, by the state and society. An escort, criminalized by the state and stigmatized by the society. Um, you know, the list can go on and on. Um, whether it be fet work, or fetish work, whether it be um, something more traditional, right? And so. You have that, you have those layers, right, which are barriers to organizing, right, because police, um, not that, you know, people going on strike out in the open don't also interact with police like that, but, um, you know, we get a little bit of different interaction with them, right, uh, if they raid a brothel or a massage parlor, etc. So just for folks to understand, um, you know, when people that are not in criminalized trades go out on strike, different insults are hurled at them, typically whore, slut, um, you know, those, those aren't typically hurled at them, right? Um, that kind of gender-based um, language, um, this violence, those kinds of targeting things don't happen. So you have like the societal stigma, and you also have the criminalization by the state that you deal with. Now again, I could say, that being said, I mentioned the DMSC um, committee in India, which boasts 50,000 members in their union. Um, I can also talk about the largest um, Spanish sex workers um, trade association in Madrid. Um, they have over 30,000 members. Um, there are 12,000 um, Nigerian commercial sex workers in Anambra who just went on strike in 2015 and won major harm reduction policies, um, at HIV testing, um, community centers, etc., because of their strike activity. Um, we could talk about Strauss um, Syndicate in France. Um, you should work with them. They're lovely people. Um, we could talk about Keswa in Kenya, again in the tens of thousands of membership. And Rad Trad Sex in Argentina. Um, they just recently participated in the gender um, strike. And they also boast tens of thousands of members as well. So just to say, like, it is happening. Um, and, you know, sex workers here in this country um, are looking to international examples of, of solidarity and struggle amongst workplace organizing and organizing around um, sex trade um, labor. So it, it's happening. It's just this country is particularly despicable. So we have a question from Mark. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for the presentation. I have actually like seven questions. I'm trying to focus. I want to try to focus on issues. Two questions. One addressing obstacles. One addressing potential. Sure. Um, it is like my experience that sort of the traditional bourgeois feminists of the 80s are an obstacle to your work. Yes, they are. Um, and right, Capitalist and so forth. In the, the moment of the 80s, of like all work, all work, all, all sex is rich. Right. Um, Jordan, and, McKinnon, all work. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I remember there was a colleague of me when I was working at The Nation who tried to, a Canadian who tried to publish an article about the advancements of decolonization of sex work in Canada, and they just absolutely across the board, the editorial board, refused this article. Just even so you didn't give it to them. And I really want to sense at least of your critique, how do you navigate that? Because I think it's very interesting on the one hand that like how you laid it out, particularly it's like the state is the question here to yeah. talk about. And the, how they these particular feminists are not even thinking about it, they're just thinking about it on a moral ground. Yeah. Um, and they're not thinking actually politically about this problem. And so that's like one sort of like how to navigate that obstacle uh, with particular, especially in America, right? Mm -hmm. So two is potential, meaning also here like there's clearly like international solidarity that can happen. Um, but I am wondering what, given the fact that there are countries where decriminalization of sex work is in place already, um, Canada being one strong example. 
Um, what really comes after for sex work after decriminalization? Meaning, like, I know obviously it's difficult to get there, but if in America you would fulfill the proper decriminalization of sex work, meaning what comes after? What is really the potential of like organizing this branch of work yeah. into sort of a larger movement for potential for even socialist ideas, for example? Mm -hmm. And so, really, that's what I'm potential on the approach. How are we doing? Are we taking like we're one, one, and then we're gonna... one at a time? Cool. Yeah. Oh, I can. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so, great questions. Those get absolutely at the crux of the issue that I think that um, political and radical sex workers and sex workers who are organizing themselves are, are facing, just sex workers in general, um, dealing with um, whore phobia of society, but also state based violence. Um, so, yeah, uh, feminist, man, um, I, am, I am one of them, and um, I am, I've got to tell you, um, if people miss, where did, where did Jasmine go? Um, yeah, I think an amazing talk, um, well, like, protest speech, um, right, um, that you can find online um, for, uh, May, uh, for March 8th, and that, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's incredible, um, and it addresses this in particular, right, which is we should stop allowing the people who are not feminist to identify as such. Um, because anybody that says that um, you as a worker do not deserve a safe working environment because sex is your labor, absolutely is not feminist, okay? And the fact that they've been allowed to just like putrefy a tradition of uh, political uh, organizing and theoretical work is absolutely disgusting to me. Um, so yeah, we should take feminism away from them because um, they've, they've done wrong by it. Um, but yeah, sex work exclusive um, feminists, um, or sometimes swerves or swefs, depending on uh, where you're organizing, are, are a central problem, right? Because they come from a theoretical position that doesn't recognize you, uh, your body, really, or your agency as a worker. And so that's a, that's a major obstacle and hurdle, right? Because they are mixed all around in the morality of um, political discussions, you know, now, and, and who gets to... Um, say that they have agency and, and he does not. Um, I would say that feminism has a problem with work, and I think that that's where we have to um, also address. Feminism has a problem with work. Um, that's a Melissa Gere Grant quote, gotta give cred. Um, and feminism also has a problem with the state. Um, and so we could also, I mean, there could be a whole other panel on this, that's right? <laughs> yeah, um, we should do that. Um, but those are, those are the, two, <laughs> the two main things. Um, and so when you have those particular right. obstacles, not only does the majority of society hate you, even though they patron you, um, right, uh, you also have, you have that, um, so you have the social stigma, but then you have the state-based violence, and then if you're becoming like a politically active worker, right, you have to contend with the theoretical garbage and backwater, right, that, um, that's just been accumulating um, since, yeah, since the 80s, well, really since the 60s. Um, post decriminalization, God, what a world. It'd be like Oz, you know what I mean? Like, I, I can't even, um, the, the decriminalized areas now of different states still experience um, police antagonism and brutality. Um, they still experience social stigma. Um, and so we can have this conversation a little bit later as well, but um, post decrim was gonna, is gonna look a lot different than um, just places that haven't ever criminalized it directly too, right? That still just deal with that social stigma. Okay, Richard. Yeah, so um, going to the sex work question, so to begin by saying that I'm opposed, I strongly support decriminalization of sex work, that people, sex workers, and people with HIV should be decriminalized, or harassed, or stigmatized. But still, like, like, and and even going back to the question of feminism, part of the problem, I think, is the term like sex work, right? that there is some sense that most people have that erotic labor or sex shouldn't be commodified, right? That even the existence of the commodification, even if that's the case, is some kind of regrettable necessity, right? So that therefore the question of sex work is tied up with the broader question of sexual liberation, right? And the second thing, listening to what you're saying, I think to myself, well, suppose you achieved everything you're trying to achieve with decriminalization, you have legal brothels that are safe and everything is above board and there's no harassment. Like in some respects, that would also be completely compatible with a neoliberal program. Mm -hmm. 
right? right? Just like the state stops harassing people who are not causing anybody else any problem. And so I guess sort of what is the vision then beyond that neoliberal program? And also just out of curiosity, what area you didn't mention was workers in like the adult film industry sure. and stuff. I'm just curious about organizing up. But I want to sort of the broader cool. theoretical question about how you see that, like the sense that people have of yes, but sex or erotic labor, <laughs> that basically <laughs> sex shouldn't be labor, right? Mm -hmm. And that if it is labor, that's because capitalism is somehow degrading erotic life. Sure. Um, I really don't want to disappoint anybody, but sex is not sacred. Um, sex is uh, just this thing, right, um, that we have built up and created really bizarre, bizarre ideas and feelings around. Um, but it happens to just be bodies interacting um, in various ways, uh, and new ways are invented all the time. Um, if you think it's sacred, I'm really, really sorry. Um, it's not. Uh, we live under capitalism. People are forced to uh, labor to survive for, you know, and work for a wage. And that's the reality that we contend with right now um, in this moment, um, not theoretically, but very practically. And so um, I think that that's where I always have to ground back. So in other political conversations, I really do deal with the realm of a, a theoretical conception of, of work, right, and, and what labor can be. Um, but I think when I talk about sex work, I, I feel a particular kind of responsibility to ground it right here in the now and the role that the state plays um, in the target of harassment, et cetera. And so what I'm concerned with most um, for myself as a sex worker, right, is harm reduction and, um, and intervening um, within the harms that exist, right, to, to actually alleviate those things so that I can be a stronger individual to smash the state. Um, and so I'll, just, I'll put that that way. Um, yeah, sex is not sacred. Um, I, I do think that, like, it's also uh, sometimes more cheekily called the oldest profession in the world. Um, and it certainly has a, a pre capitalist history that we could also look at, too. That'd be another exciting panel. Um, but it also it has, like, different iterations of itself, right, in different kinds of societies with different versions of um, statehood or, or, or what have you. Um, and so we can talk about the implications of, of labor and, and violence um, pre-capitalism pre as well, um, and pre-late, late capitalism or the neoliberal project um, as it stands today. Um, absolutely, we have to look at it um, as, as being competitive work, right? So, so work can flex itself into and fit itself into different molds of, of what uh, given economies look like, right? Including the neoliberal project. Um, what I'm saying is um, organizing to, to directly um, push back against and, and combat that, both with the social stigma that exists against workers, um, but also the economic um, disenfranchisement right uh, of workers too. So um, foreign organizing, we, we, can all, we can talk about that after, um, but there are usually campaign-based um, initiatives like Prop 60, thank God, was defeated in California. Um, and there are different things like that that are happening where uh, adult entertainers and erotic laborers do issue-based organizing, and there are, similarly to like Actors' Equity, there are organizations that exist like that um, because it's not a directly criminalized activity, right? So. Okay. Um, Reed, you were next. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of ask a question about um, bringing it back to the rationale behind the, that we had in formulating this panel. Um, you know, in the 19th century, there was this sense that the goal um, would be for a society that could do without the state, that no longer needed a state in the sense of organized co forces of coercion regulating society for, uh, you know, in ways that it couldn't do for itself. Um, and, you know, so, and then the working class struggle was understood to be kind of integrally bound up with um, the struggle to smash the state, you know, both for Marxism and anarchism in different ways. But by the early 20th century, the working class movement had kind of culminated in this alliance of labor and capital that was brokered through the state, such that um, it seemed like the state had become the necessary outcome of the class struggle, as opposed to the abolition of the state being the necessary outcome. And of course, the 20th century, that kind of changes, but it, the state is still necessary. If anything, the working class movement no longer seems necessary. So uh, by, you know, not completely, but so my question is, um, you know, is the abolition of the state still possible? Is it still necessary? And if it is, what's the role of the working class? What's the role of the labor movement? And what's the role of socialism? 
Well, okay, I'll, I'll start. First of all, I think we often have a misconception what the working class is. I think the working class is larger than it's ever been. It just changed. Maybe we have fewer miners in the sense of people going into the third. But, you know, sex workers, computer technology, you know, keyboard operators, I mean, there's a zillion new occupations that people couldn't even conceive of in the 19th century. And there's old occupations like servants, like butlers, and so on, who have drastically declined. There's very few of those people as a percentage of the workforce. So I think there still is a powerful working class out there. And I think what has happened is the state has managed in most places to sort of co-opt parts of the labor movement or parts of the working class to making concessions while repressing the more radical elements. Let's not forget in the United States, the Palmer raids, McCarthyism, and so on. In other words, so the people who want more than 50 cents more an hour, they actually want fundamental changes. Those people you stigmatize, you throw them in jail, whatever, whatever pretense, right? Uh, and then on the other hand, you want people want 50 cents an hour, maybe you give them their 50 cents an hour for now. Of course, later, once the whole movement is broken, right, and is weakened and divided, the way they expelled all the left-wing led unions from the CIO in the United States, for example. Then you can go back and take back those concessions you made. So it's, it's like Rosa Luxemburg said, it's like the labor of Sisyphus who's rolling this rock up the hill to trade unions out. And it's going to keep doing that, rolling the rock up the hill and then the rock rolling back down on you until you manage to smash the state, until you manage to replace it. Now, is that going to be easy? No. Is that going to even be possible? I don't know. Right? Maybe it's not possible. Maybe it's a nice theoretical wish that can't be fulfilled. But short of that, right, you're not going to really have fundamental changes. And as a historian, the one reason why I think that perhaps the state uh, can actually be smashed is let's say we were sitting here, oh, say, 800 years ago, and we're a bunch of heretics, and we're talking about could we ever, ever break the Pope's control of Europe. I mean, the Pope just runs everything. Would we ever have any sort of freedom of religion? And people would say, ah, oh, it's never going to happen. It's going to be impossible. So, you know, times change. You can't, can't foresee the future. Uh, I may add something. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, smashing of the state, uh, it always uh, asks or it addresses uh, two questions, I think. Uh, and, uh, first question is, can we live totally without state understanding, understood as we can uh, live without any uh, social uh, institution or mediation uh, like the, to uh, organize social life, uh, to organize economy, to, uh, because uh, if we think that uh, when we smash the state and uh, institute uh, and uh, finally uh, arrive to communism, it's going to be uh, a paradise, like everybody's going to be friends and brothers. And <laughs> this would be very nice, but I think we, we are still human. Even after that, we, we are going to have some passions, some conflicts some uh, disagreements, and we have to face collectively challenges to, to organize them. And the problem with the state is it's uh, organized, so the, maybe the, the goal should not be smashing the state. And it was not at some point. It is because the state is oppressing us, and it's something that is so, uh, that we have to compose, that is a, uh, a burden and uh, an obstruction on our free uh, organization. So the question is, and the goal is not smashing the state, but building a society based on freedom and equality. And for that, we have to create new institutions and new uh, relationship to these institutions. So it's not something that at some point we don't control anymore. But it's something that we reflect on, we discuss, we criticize, and uh, through that very process, 
we learn to trust each other, to build with, uh, together, to, to get some smart uh, ideas, to stimulate our creativity. And then it's, uh, it's directly, uh, I would say, or maybe not directly, but uh, it's an intimate uh, and living relation. Um, I have a question. Hi. Um, I tried to frame my question in the framework of like the sex work topic, ah, but I tried. I would like to like pose it to the whole, whole panel. Um, do you believe that the the success of, of a sex workers union could be achieved without a, a broader working class like solidarity? And do you think that this solidarity is like possible on the like immediate interest of other groups? Or that the uh, ID and like uh, a working body, like party or organization, that goes like beyond the immediate interest, is necessary to achieve even the immediate goal of uh, sex workers' union. Sure. Um, just to address that, I think that there, there's a lot of things that happen that have to happen concurrently, right? And so you need that um, the the combating of the social stigma, which I think that decriminalization actually helps to do, right? And then you also need workers self-organizing, right, and self-activity. And so when you have those things working in tandem, I actually think you have stronger possibility to actually see that kind of success, right? In terms of movement building, in terms of like workplace organizing and victory, right? Um, so I would say that those two things have to happen simultaneously. Um, I would say that just looking at um, the kinds of organizing that's taking place, like with Strauss and Friends, um, or it's with some of the other um, union activity, like in India or in Africa, um, they're actually like winning quite a bit of ground in terms of social services, in terms of like forcing the state to actually like end harassment and pro and provide like material um, goods, right? So community service centers, screening, testing sites, etc. Like monetary, uh, the ability to retire, right? If you're an elderly sex worker, like those kinds of things, right? Or actual um, harm reductions and, and beneficial gains. Um, and so I think that that's that's a part of that too. But I absolutely think. Um, that uh, you have to address um, the social stigma, the morality, the really backward and detrimental morality um, that quite a few of our societies hold um, toward this group of workers in order to actually like advance a, a workplace struggle, right? Because you have um, not just the state, right, and not just the armed bodies of men, right, coming at you, but but you have um, their wives. Um, <laughs> you have um, other other workers, you know. Uh, and so I think that that's um, something that we have to continually remind ourselves as well, right? If we want to see some kind of actual achievement, uh, we have to combat that kind of like social stigma as well as the more um, the political work of, um, of organizing workplaces. Oh, yeah, um, it's not related to, to that, but I liked your, um, your way of phrasing uh, what you said is like a housing of power. Um, and, uh, you know, I think. Traditionally, the state has been, you know, like it's always a power over, um, uh, you know, the, the constituents that are within it. Um, do, you, do you think any, and this is for me, but I'm kind of like, any sustainable housing of power is equivalent to the state? Or if, it's, if there is some way to do a housing of power, which maybe not necessarily is power over, or could be, is there, is there something else that it would be, and what would that be called? Yeah, yeah, well, I think the thing is to move from the repression of people and the control over people to just having a state, if you want to call it a state, that administers things. That is to say, someone has to organize launching those telecommunication satellites like to our cell phones. Right? That does not have to be an oppressive function. So in other words, that would, in a sense, you could say what you want to move to is a state that's not only truly democratic, I don't mean just voting and various procedures like that, but also where the repressive functions have been taken away. That they're administering things that operates as Lenin said, like the post office. Or to these days, we would just say the internet. <laughs> Damn. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, so go ahead, yeah. I don't know if answer. The thing is, uh, we have to organize power, whether you can call it 
the state or social institutions or public services mm -hmm. uh, because we are the, the, the precise uh, goal or aim uh, of politics is to organize social life uh, and how it um, affects us if we can't uh, change the laws and if the law are not uh, experienced as uh, they are coming from yourself as uh, you can understand it, you can criticize it, you can participate effectively if you want, you can directly participate through its very elaboration and and then have some institutions that invite, that incites to this kind of uh, behavior that calls for 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 your participation and not just exclude you as uh, voting is uh, now because uh, also said uh, uh, the, the Englishmen they believe they're free because they are, they vote every five years they they, they decide a lot and yeah so it's one uh, Sunday of uh, freedom and then <laughs> and uh, the way you express it is is not even direct. You can't say, hey, we want equality. No, you say, I want him. <laughs> him. And you have no control over what they are doing the day after. And the very day after, he, he does something totally different. And you say, hey, see you in five years. <laughs> so we have to uh, go. Uh, and actually, it's, uh, I would say, it's, uh, it shows how uh, assimilating voting to democracy shows how much our imagination is room because we have to uh, it's uh, it's an everyday thing it's not meaning that uh, every day you have to start uh, again from uh, zero no but this is a process and there are some long-term questions and short-term questions and you have uh, anyway. It has to address to everybody and uh, to be experienced as it's an emanation of some collective will. Not not meaning it's consensus on everything, and, but we have to create procedures to regulate context about uh, what should we do, how we uh, uh, organize uh, economy. Uh, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. And I will say there will still, uh, maybe I think, uh, I'm a bit pessimistic maybe on that, but we will need some uh, limitation and uh, meaning uh, not oppressive, but uh, coercive power. Because if there's a crime, how, how if someone kills someone, how will we respond to that? Sure, we want uh, that uh, mentality to of such violence uh, getting uh, derailing uh, for time, because when you experience uh, uh, sensitive and equality practice practices, uh, you you're less violent. You 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 you're better at understanding <coughs> the desires and the, the conflicts, and you have other ways to, but. It won't be uh, from uh, over the night. So we will uh, we will have to create institutions to address the pro the very problem we are facing. And hopefully, some will disappear, but some will stay, and some new ones will uh, arise, and we will have to compete with that. But uh, in a way that uh, we are not waiting a savior or an ideal uh, paradise that that will eliminate everything. No, we will face it through time, through experience, through, and we will be better and better. Hopefully. In fact, if I can just add on that line, I always like the saying that I think it was Strauss who came up with or somebody that all of humanity has suffered three different areas of pain: hunger, sex, and death. And he said, socialism can only deal with the first hunger. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question now? Yes. Um, 
So two things. One, the nation state, the democratic republic itself, grows out of the struggle for freedom of the legal revolutions. Marx's insight, it seems, in 1848 is to show how this becomes sort of a, a contradiction, that the democratic republic, which promised to be the, the liberating force, um, becomes the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Right? And that, that, that becomes the historical lesson of the 19th century that the Marxists are supposed to supersede through their political practice. Um, and so itself is a result of struggles for freedom. The nation state itself a result of struggles for freedom. Um, and I, I don't know if that is that something you agree with or if that's something that, how do we deal with that? But the second was a more specific question for Jamil and maybe Bill. Um, the second international was brought up. Uh, you said that the danger there was this creation of a professional class of socialist politicians um, and that they didn't listen to the people. They didn't listen to the masses. And yet, I mean, if we take a sampling of this period of the early 20th century, it seems like the working people of Germany actually wanted to go to war. Um, and so in that, in that way, actually, the party, you could say, did listen to the people, maybe didn't lead them um, in ways in which could have helped them advance their own freedom. Um, so how does the socialist, like the socialists, deal with the freedom problem if they are in power? Um, right, like it, the smashing of the state, we, that's the horizon. But how does one, how does one deal with the power of the state if the socialists are capable of taking power? How does one work towards the freedom problem? Do we have anything to learn from 1917? Is there, how do we deal with the power question today? Um, very good question. Thank you for asking them. Could you just uh, be a bit more specific on the first one? Uh, uh, sorry, can you, could you remind me? Uh, I Maybe the first uh, one wasn't a question. Just uh, okay. I, I just wanted, because we're talking so, about the yeah, nation yeah, so, 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 repressive sorry. apparatus, but it's a kind of historical problem. It becomes a repressive. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I do think that the uh, French Revolution, even if it was a bourgeois, uh, at some point it was straight to, uh, to a liberation process. It has to be radicalized, and that's what the uh, workers' movement tried to do after that. And because they were addressing the bourgeoisie, saying, "Hey, uh, okay, now they are not uh, privileges anymore. Okay, you you are on the equal uh, uh, scale uh, with uh, the former rulers, uh, the aristocracy. But what about us?" And what about the economic question? Because you say everybody's free and they can make money, but we are doomed. At some point, we have capital and you can exploit us. And we don't have uh, base capital and we don't, uh, we, uh, this is just like, a, uh, this is just like uh, that you rule over people for so long time and it was your privilege. And after some that, after that, you say, "Hey, now you're free. But I'm free to you're free to work for me. To work on it all. It's not uh, the, the and they manage to to overcome that uh, by collective action. And uh, because at some point they had to to face real uh, issues, economic issues, uh, health issues. They were dying." They were working like uh, 14 hours a, a day without any uh, day off. And they had the, facing this situation, they had the, the greatness and the, the great creativity and the great smartness to say, okay, we're gonna save a little bit uh, in mutual or social uh, uh, insurance based uh, organization the former, the ancestors of the social insurgency, and we are going to organize this ourselves and build collectively, uh, like uh, I said, some some shield or some maybe some uh, harvest harvest uh, no uh, how harvest uh, haven, uh, haven, yeah, yeah, yeah. haven that will 
help us to to face some great uh, dangers and some problems. With. And the second point, uh, with your remark on uh, the second uh, international, and uh, I'm not saying that um, the rulers should always follow, uh, follow uh, the people, thinking that the people uh, is perfect. And, uh, in itself, that, that uh, because sometimes in uh, Marxist view, uh, proletariat is seen as uh, they are so dignified, uh, and so they are so decent, they are so beautiful, they are, they are struggling, and this is like uh, you are idealizing them on a moral uh, standpoint. But uh, it's not true. There, uh, when you face this many. Struggles and this many bad situation, you are in a bad shape. But when you organize to and uh, give some uh, great answers to to that allows you to to make uh, uh, to make uh, some great values as equality, decency, liberty to live, oh, then, then you are. This is the the. These kind of realizations uh, from the working class these are absolutely beautiful. Uh, but uh, what I was addressing uh, is the fact that when you when you think uh, you, uh, you are the the experts uh, leading the educated man, un uneducated mass masses, uh, it creates a relationship. Uh, where you think you don't have to learn anything from the, the people, from uh, what their experiences, and you, you cut yourself from their insight and from their creativity. And uh, we should find a relation, a relation uh, with uh, leaders and but uh, not uh, instituted forever leaders, meaning they have uh, the, the knowledge of the, the capital from Marx and this is the Bible and I know what. No, it, it, it has to be a, a living relationship and you, you, you have to get some strong analysis, some strong uh, theoretical uh, link to the reality and trying to, to open some possibilities uh, in this situation but you have to stay open and humble enough to to understand that you don't know everything and that uh, plus if you experience only uh, the if you aim only at the effic uh, very efficiently uh, at, the, at, the, at winning the elections you learn something else in the process you learn so much of uh, demagogy, uh, uh, intrigue, uh, and this is not good because we are <coughs> a society where we are equals, not uh, you're gonna save us. Um, I don't know if I'm... So, uh, seeing the, the question uh, in uh, uh, just before the war, saying, hey, uh, now you are people wanted to go to war, if uh, we didn't make, maybe, I don't know, I'm not a divine, if these kind of errors weren't made, and if uh, the working class was more autonomous and more, uh, and more, and better organized, maybe they wouldn't count so. Just one quick yeah, academic, yeah, 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 yeah. One quick academic point. I don't think the German working class did want to go to war. I think that's you know basically a long established myth that we've accepted, uh, and I think there's a lot of evidence they didn't want to go to war. The hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them that were out on the streets in the, all the major cities in July, right before the the war starts in August fourth, and the fact that while the Germans were opposed. To take Paris. They almost had Paris before their offense was broken. German soldiers were already shooting their officers. But Luxembourg said that, 
Councilmember said that the um, the secret like treaty, I guess, or whatever, um, with the unions that the yesterday. Th that's had, true. The union the leadership. And the union leadership. The union leadership. And the, and the parliamentary people, because they didn't want to oppose the war, because that meant they lose all their institutional gains and their cushy offices and their salaries. But that doesn't mean the average worker who was out there had any desire to kill his French comrades, particularly. Oh, certainly many did, but I mean, not talking about every single one. In fact, there's lots of evidence. I talked about it in my last book. People's <laughs> <laughs> history of modern Europe. I read it. Uh, but in any case, uh, I mean, I think that's grossly exaggerated. Grossly exaggerated. Any more than all Americans who went to Vietnam were there because they were just hell bent on killing Vietnamese. Okay. No? This is our last question. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm usually the one who comes when the next panel has a chance to vote for them. I don't want to take up too much of your time. But um, I always try to some discussion for you for class. And it seems to me that. All three treatments uh, that we presented were kind of efficient then. I'm surprised that Bill, who I know quite well, and the class is a fundamental issue. But to regard the capitalist state as simply a mechanism of smashing the workers' union, um, it is that. But it also uh, smashes or uh, extends the hegemony capitalist culture of thought, which goes beyond simply unarmed, uh, you know, uh, unarmed suppression. And I think that that's an area, and we obviously know that you've talked about this, but that has to be brought in the discussion. Uh, otherwise, you have too narrow a discussion of the capitalist state. Uh, I want to give a couple other questions. Uh, I'm bad at remembering names of two old, but... It's Brett. It's Brett. Brett talks about the sex trade and sex workers as people who provide sexual services to individuals. And they, of course, are workers. But the sex trade is much broader than just people who provide sexual, individual sexual services. It also involves an advertising industry, which is going to people's sexual frustrations and sexual hang up to sell items. And this is, to me, as much as the sex trade. But it's an important aspect of the sex trade as the individual, you know, on the street corner or taking customers to have sexual activity. So I think that, you know, you're maybe you are just dealing with that, but I wonder whether you see that as part of the problem or maybe a relevant secondary one of the problems. Um, and the other, the third uh, speaker, I mean, he seems to identify the is in this class considerations altogether, and it talks about the creativity of the people when that's the best and learn from it. But the people as a category, which is you know, popular these days, uh, seems to me to reflect class differences with different kinds of people who have different interests, sometimes fundamentally different, and so that you can't talk about the whole people doing this and running this and stuff like that. Concerned about that. Okay. So maybe I guess someone has a question. Sure. Yeah. I'll go ahead and start then. Yeah. So I mean, where to begin? Um, when we talk about the commercial sex industry, um, I think it's also helpful to talk about um, other industries of care providing um, or service um, that are often uh, that I think are actually like very easily um, comparable when, we, when we're thinking about questions about well, what makes up the whole industry, right, or trade. Um, and so, for instance, if sex work wasn't necessarily criminalized, right, I think we could talk about home care workers, I think we could talk about other care providing professions like nursing, etc., domestic care, or just other service-based work, right? Um, and I think that when we begin to characterize work as work, um, and we can broadly see what different industries are actually require laborers to, um, you know, to do um, or to include or um, like provide the actual um, avenues for that labor. I mean, we can look at advertisements. Um, we can look at the selling of, of objects for sexual pleasure, right? Sex toy shops or videos, uh, right? That need laborers to create those things. 
um, whether they be criminalized laborers or not, right? If you're buying a dildo, it's likely made in Taiwan or China. And we could talk about the egregious working conditions in, in factory-based workshops, I mean, all over the place, right? But you could talk about the artisanal glass dildo and the problems that that creates under capitalism, right? Um, just like other artisanal, you know, items and the way that we have this like hyper individualistic conception of, of what gives us pleasure or care. I think we could have that conversation in tandem with a conversation that complicates um, both what uh, working movements and feminism um, do um, with the problem of work, right, um, or the problem of care uh, and labor. And so we can have, that, that could be a part of that conversation, but I do think it's a bit secondary or tertiary even to the problem of criminalization of labor, right, um, which absolutely has wrapped in it um, class considerations. And like I said earlier, there's a stratification within the sex trade. Um, there's a stratification amongst workers. Um, and there's all kinds of, that raises all kinds of problems, right, that we don't have the time to, to suss out here. Um, but that absolutely includes um, the special oppression of trans bodies, um, special oppression of bodies of color within that work too. Um, we can't leave those things out of these conversations. Uh, I, w I wish we had more time to, uh, to kind of delve into this. Yes. Thank you very much for the question. And, uh, I mean, uh, I, I totally agree with uh, what you said. And, uh, I'm sorry I wasn't clear enough, uh, maybe on that uh, point of view. Maybe because I wanted to highlight uh, some uh, economist, reductionist uh, 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 view, uh, flows of economist, reductionist flows. But you are absolutely right. Uh, um, if uh, we only, because uh, evidently, without economic uh, equality, you can't talk about freedom. How can we even consider seriously that uh, a billionaire is uh, as free as a, a homeless guy? Uh, it's not serious. So at some point, uh, Freedom and equality are very linked. <clears throat> you can't be really uh, free if there are uh, indecent uh, wetness in uh, so few hands and, and uh, so so much uh, uh, inequality. Uh, it's, it doesn't make sense. But you know, the, in the on the other side, uh, there is not real equality if some decide and some just execute all the time. So it is very intimately and uh, when I talk about the creativity of the, of the people, I'm not sure I, I said that, but uh, I wanted to bring uh, an example uh, of uh, you're absolutely right of what uh, you, because if we uh, understand freedom just as uh, economic wealth or power, I think it's a mistake because uh, this view is a prisoner of the, the bourgeois worldview. If uh, you reduce the, the goal in life, uh, just uh, be, have some more comfort or wealth, uh, uh, wealth net for everybody, it's lacking uh, the, the freedom part. And uh, just an example, uh, as an example, in the 19th uh, century, when I talked about uh, the, uh, the creations, the, uh, the institution created by, by the working class uh, uh, as the as the mutual, uh, the, the uh, practical and uh, direct uh, organization and administration as, uh, of uh, concrete solidarity. Uh, it uh, it was for me it, it is a very important creation and a very radical one because it uh, not because it just uh, not because it uh, threatens the, the state it, it, it didn't but it created new mentality and new uh, and there were people were experiences experience were experiencing the fact that they can do something and they can uh, create uh, 
like uh, the, the germ and the, the, the project of a society based on other values than wealthness and uh, as the only goal, but based on equality, freedom, and solidarity. So uh, on this side, it was uh, maybe one of the biggest blow to capitalism as uh, it was crushing uh, its mankind. Yeah, I completely agree with your criticism now. I mean, as George Lukács said, the struggle of the proletariat to achieve class consciousness is not just a struggle against the external enemy, the bourgeoisie. It's an internal struggle against the degrading effect the bourgeoisie has had on the class consciousness. I think the state plays a tremendous role in establishing a cultural and political hegemony that makes people think in certain ways, such as the whole idea of sex work is something evil or whatever it might be, nationalism, racism, sexism. I think that's an important role, uh, equal to the repressive role. I go into it more in detail, but I see we're out of time. Thank you very much. Please give our panelists a round of applause.